the System Administration Miniconf. We have two more talks for you today. First up, we have Matthew telling us about getting started with Docker and Swarm. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Ewan. Hi, my name is Matt. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his. And um, as Ewan said, I'm going to be talking about uh, Docker and Swarm. Now, um, if you, if any of you saw uh, Steve Ellis's talk earlier, um, this talk is not for you. This is very much an introduction. Um, which I have condensed down from about about forty five minutes, hopefully to about fifteen, um, and it's a real a real basic introduction of like why you might want to use Docker. Uh, so, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians in the country throughout Australia and the, their connections to the land, sea, and community. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So I only recently discovered Docker um, about six to eight months ago uh, during lockdown, um, and it has completely changed how I think about deploying software. So I figured maybe other people haven't discovered it yet, and it, this might be useful to them. Um, so Docker is what is known as a container runtime, which enables you to build, deploy, and manage containers. Containers are kind of like virtual machines, um, except really not quite. Um, they are a combination of a disk image or file system into which uh, you get cherooted, um, and they uh, consist of a bunch of namespaces and C groups, which limit what a container can see and what it can do. Uh, a container can actually be created with a handful of standard Linux commands um, without actually needing Docker, but Docker makes a whole bunch of things easier. Um, if you're interested in getting into the detail of how containers are created. Um, there's this great talk by Liz Rice, which I have linked. Incidentally, uh, the GitHub link at the top of my slides linked to the examples that I'm using today, as well as the uh, slide deck. So containers can help you by creating a consistent environment for, um, for all, all of your applications. Um, that environment could be the same between development, production, testing. Um, because you're, you're controlling the, the file system, you have full access to like, making sure that everything is pretty much the same as it would be in production. It allows you to segregate between apps, um, sandbox and limit their privileges, isolate their code from their data, simplify their deployment. Um, and it's worth noting that converting an app to run within a container doesn't have to be a big unmanageable project. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on. Um, so the first thing you will want to do is you'll want to install Docker. I haven't got time to go into the details of that, and it's really well documented on their website. They do have like a curl pipe bash thing if you really want to use that. Um, but that basically, on a Debian system, for example, that will just set up some repos and install you know, the packages from the official Docker repo. Or you can pull it from your favorite distribution if you'd like to use that version. Um, if you'd like to play along, uh, there are instructions um, in the GitHub repo at the top of this page, um, and that's them there as well. So if you want to run a Docker container, um, I was going to go through these as examples, but I don't think I'll have the time. So I'm just going to go with the screenshots for the moment. Um, you could run a command like docker run minus minus rm minus it space ubuntu space bash. So that will uh, that tells Docker, go and pull the Ubuntu container from the official Docker repository or the, the um, official Docker registry. Um, minus minus rm says delete the container when I'm done with it. And minus i and minus t say make this interactive and give me a terminal. Uh, and bash says what command you want it to run when it runs. So when once you run that, it says, oh, look, I couldn't find Ubuntu on my machine. So I'm going to pull all of the components of that container off the internet. Um, and then I'm going to run it. And it puts you in a shell because you asked it for bash. And you can see if I run a PS within that shell that um, the bash that I'm running is actually PID1 according to the container. So you can see that it's isolated from my the rest of my operating system. And then when I exit the container, because I pass minus minus RM, it's going to quit, um, close the container off. So I mean, that's a pretty basic example. Uh, not super useful, but bear with me. Um, let's talk a little bit about how container images are created first. Um, they're file systems uh, that are usually built using a Docker file. Um, they can be based off other images, which creates a set of layers. So I could say, I want to base this image off the Ubuntu image, or I want to base it off this other image, which is based off a different image. Um, Docker files are just a, a configuration um, language that allow you to specify how these layers get built. So let's have a look at a really basic example. Um, this is um, 
a Docker file that just says, take the Ubuntu 20.04 um, container image off Docker Hub, uh, and we're going to change the default command that it uses. Now, by default, uh, the Ubuntu image um, st starts bash. So we didn't actually need to explicitly start bash in our previous set of slides. Um, but I have changed that so that it is instead echoing Hello World. And you can see um, that I've got it in a folder here. So if I were to run Docker build, which builds that image, it's, I specify the current directory using dot. Um, I use minus T to tag the image with the label Hello World. Um, and you can see that it goes and builds the image. And then when I run it in the same way that we ran the image before, it says Hello World and then it exits. Um, so basically, Docker allows you to run applications in an environment with a known image. Uh, it consistent, it's, it's consistent between development and testing and production environments, and it keeps apps separated and contained so they don't affect the host OS. Um, it makes managing, uh, managing and upgrading and removing quite trivial because you can basically pull, you know, set up a new container, pull it down, and then say, all right, close this one and start up the next, start up the new version. Um, so that's great if you've got a single, a single container. What if you've got images, uh, uh, um, an app that uses multiple containers, like for example, a web server that uses a database? So we can group these together. Um, these are colloquially known as pods. Um, this can be done manually with Docker with a handful of commands, but using a tool like Docker Compose on your desktop is a little bit more elegant. Again, Docker Compose is, is easy to install. It's a single binary application. Um, and there are clear instructions on the Docker website about that. So to use Docker Compose, you can create a file called docker-compose.yml, which is um, a YAML format file. Um, it contains configurations for grouping related containers. So we're going to make a really simple web app that stores data within Redis. So this is the, uh, these are the files that I'm playing with here. So we've got a Docker file, we've got my Docker Compose file, we've got a requirements.txt, and we've got a web app.py. So um, the last two first, um, basically this is a web app that does nothing more than um, connects to a Redis database on a separate host called Redis over here. Um, and then it says, hello, you know, my refresh count is whatever, and it pulls that data out of Redis. So this is just to demonstrate that these two containers are cannot talking to each other. And the requirements.txt is just the, um, the Python requirements for the app. Uh, the Docker file is a little complex. It's saying that we're going to pull the Python Alpine image. Alpine is a tiny Linux distro that's optimized for, doc um, for Docker containers. Um, we're going to set our working directory to slash app. We're going to set some environment variables. We're going to use the Alpine package manager to pull in some dependencies, copy in the requirements.txt. Um, we're going to use pip to install our requirements. We're going to tell Docker to expose port 5000 so that we can access that from our host machine if we need to. We're going to copy the current directory that the Docker file is in into slash app in our container. And then the command we're going to run is flask run. Uh, and then the Docker compose file has a bunch of version information and it's got two services. It's got a web service and a Redis service. The Redis service is just pulling the stock Redis image from Docker Hub. Um, and the web service is going to build the image that is specified in the current directory. It's going to tag it as matsan slash simple web app. Um, and it's going to expose port 5000 explicitly. So let's run that. So we use the docker dash compose command, which um, is what manages all the docker compose stuff. So we run docker compose up. And we're going to specify minus D, which backgrounds um, the, the container setup so that we can get our shell back and do interesting things. So it's going to create uh, a network for, the, for our containers. It's going to pull down the Python image and build all of the, the instructions that I gave it. And then it's going to remove any intermediate containers that created in the process. Um, it tags that with matsend slash simple web app. And then it creates our two containers, um, web and Redis. And then we're done. Then it's then it's running. So to test that it's running, I've just written a really basic um, shell script which will run curl on localhost column five thousand. And you can see here that it is um, incrementing this value. And I've also used Docker compose exec, which lets me get into the Redis container and run the Redis CLI command to get the refresh count from Redis. And you can see that it has incremented up to three. So these containers are talking to each other, and they're they're all contained in the same um, it, in the one Docker Compose file and you know, configured fairly clearly. So finally, we're going to clean that up. We're going to run Docker Compose down, which will delete all of our containers and our networking, and then we're done. 
So um, Docker allows you to abstract, uh, sorry, Docker Compose allows you to abstract away Docker's functionality and it automates the creation, config and management of groups of containers. Now, Docker Compose is great on a desktop um, if you're doing development stuff. Um, and it's really, really useful if you've got an app that you store on GitHub and you want people to be easily able to get up and running with it um, so that you know they don't have to go and install Python or, or Ruby or whatever. They can just have Docker install and it installs all of the rest for them. Um, if you're going to do stuff in production, um, you might want something that is kind of more you know, uh, geared towards that environment. So Docker Swarm is really good for this. Um, Docker, Docker Swarm is a container orchestrator. Um, anybody who is aware of Kubernetes um, or has heard the name, Kubernetes is another container orchestrator, but it's a lot more complicated. Docker, is fair, uh, Docker Swarm is fairly simple and it's prescriptive, so it's a little bit more ideal to smaller workloads and environments. Docker Swarm has the concept of stacks, um, which is what would be defined in something like a Docker Compose file. Um, and as it turns out, Docker Compose, uh, Docker Swarm stack files are exactly the same format as a Docker Compose file. So you can reuse that. Um, so I could have taken exactly the, um, the file that I had before, and I could have deployed that into production using Docker Swarm with a bunch of monitoring and various stuff that Docker Swarm gives you running across multiple physical hosts if I wanted to. Um, I was going to demonstrate that, but I ran out of time. There are some demos in the repo above um, if you'd like to check that out. Um, when it comes to migrating to containers, um, it's fairly straightforward to be able to, like, you, you don't have to like go all in on, on Docker to say, you know, we want to switch over to it. You could run Docker on some of your production hardware and run containers, uh, run apps in containers in a very similar way to how you're already running them um, without necessarily having to you know, abstract away all of the detail. You could run, you know, a fairly heavyweight Ubuntu image, for example, with all of the, the stuff in your container, and then, you know, over time, pull those little bits out into separate containers so that they're a little bit more isolated, um, just to make the whole workload a little bit um, less daunting. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's about all I've got, and I've got a little bit of time left. Um, so basically, all I wanted to say was give Docker a shot if you haven't already, um, because I think that it really helps to um, make deployment really easy, particularly for if you've got an open source project that you want other people to be able to contribute to. Um, one of the projects that I was working with, um, we had fairly new developers who didn't really have a full understanding of how to install like a Ruby development environment. And so we just said to them, here, install Docker, the instructions for that are really clear, and then run you know, Docker Compose up on this file and it will sort it all out for you. Um, and that helped us a lot, on, and it worked on both Windows and Linux. Um, so that's all that I've got for you. If you've got any questions for me, um, feel free to shoot me a message in Venulus um, or contact me on any of these um, any of these details. And um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. That was great, and it's been some good discussion in Venulus. Um, for me, it helped connect all of the pieces together and, and where Docker Swarm fits into the puzzle as well. Um, and I'd echo what you said about um, Docker as a solution, particularly for test environments, for instance. It's really useful if you need to test Postgres database or something like that, just to Docker install it rather than going through the whole server orchestration type stuff. So thank you very yeah, much totally. for the summary. Great talk. No worries. Thank you. And we will be back in about 10 minutes with the last of our talks for the day, um, Julian Goodwin.